in the end one thing i want to tell talk to listeners about is just observe your actions that's all it that matters uh, like forget about how much cash you're creating or whatever it is just observe your actions is it really needed or not hello hello welcome to the good garbage podcast my name is veet krishna my primary reason for existence has been to find ways to leave our wonderful planet cleaner we will be speaking with material innovators creators and propagators to learn from them how we can build for scale and towards a regenerative future their stories will help us answer the big question what is good garbage today we introduce dinesh dalipari the ceo and chief spoon seller at incredible beats dinesh has a truly inspiring journey with his roots in india and deep work ethics that came from his family to finding a deep passion and calling for a cleaner planet that came from his children and working 16 hour days for months maybe years at end to launch and build an edible cutlery company he has been completely scrappy in his approach and refuses to accept a single penny from the company until he sells over 150 spoons which is apparently the global daily consumption of disposable cutlery there is so much to learn from his zeal and passion enjoy the conversation hello hello i'm so happy today to have dinesh tarepalli who is the chief spoon seller and co-founder of incredible eats which is a manufacturer of edible spoons what has really impressed me about uh, you dinesh is your incredible energy and passion and drive So I'm so excited to talk to you and thank you for agreeing to being on the show. Thanks a lot for inviting me inviting me Ved. Um really um, really appreciate it. Great. So let's start in the beginning. I know you grew up in a beautiful area of India. Mm-hmm. Uh some of the best food we talked about it before yeah. the show. Yeah. And uh, I would love to hear and I'm sure the audience would like to know more about you growing up and also if there were any influences at that time mm. that drove your passion today. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, I I I was born and brought up in Guntur. It's a small town in Andhra Pradesh, and uh, I have been born vegetarian. Look, so my family is vegetarian. I think it's not something new for most of the Indians, but all my friends used to eat meat. But they only used to eat meat on the weekends or Sundays. That 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 used to be the meat day. And another thing is, yeah, my parents were like normal, you know, regular, like like typical middle class Indian families. And my dad was into business. I. I did my education till seventh there, and from eighth till eighth twel- uh, till twelfth, I went outside to a boarding school in Chennai. So that's that's how I know Tamil also, along with Tamil and Telugu, and uh, and then after uh, after my twelfth, uh, I went to engineering for my ECE, electronics engineering, basically. And some big lessons I learned from India is you see all like all the plus and minuses of life. Like in in US, something I really didn't like is it's so flat. It's like everyone looks the same everyone has the same similar homes lifestyle similar homes i mean except for those like ultra rich people whom we don't even look into but regularly regular crowd is it's always a flat line i would say but in india you'll see everything everyone from a, from a, the lowest to the highest and you face them every day and uh, there are some diff- big cultural things that i was very imbibed into in like an early on stages i'm a huge uh, a fan of reading all our puranas and vedas and all that stuff so like uh, i mean my my parents or my grandparents have kind of taught me from the beginning itself and that always kept me grounded and one of the very big incident that I actually told on shark tank also i'm not sure if they put everything in there but yeah is uh, my dad when i was in my 8th grade i was in chennai in my boarding school it's a pretty nice school by the way it's an international boarding school and all that stuff and he asked me to like he took me to like a five star hotel just to ex- make me experience how you no know, grand and lavish it is and not because we could stay there but yeah at least to experience it and he took me to a nice buffet there and like we really enjoyed everything and the and the same night our uh, we had to go back to guntur in a train right uh we were waiting for the train the train got delayed by like 6 7 hours i was like immediately let's go to a hotel you know let's go to a hotel and stay like no take your bed sheet put it on the floor sleep so that was a huge drastic difference i would say and that was what i i didn't like it i hated it at the time i was like what is this why should i sleep on a platform but later on in my life i realized that what well, the reason why we, he would have done that is 
uh, is basically uh, like happiness is not in your surroundings or not in your uh, what do you call it? in your lifestyles exactly it's it's there everywhere actually if you read a i uh, like i read a book about uh, like a happiness index when they were trying to find out how, what levels of people are happy they in fact figured out people who are living at the border of poverty line or just a little above the poverty line are actually more happy compared to the people who are i would say upper middle class or middle class or even average class so one in fact one 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 american guy asked dalai lama the same question how is it so drastic people always attach money to happiness or like you know being rich or being uh, this to happiness and he mentioned that because when you are only worried about your food and and shelter you don't have to worry about other problems which generally the people who have the food and shelter worry about so the level of worry is different and that's the, again all these things kind of made me into what i am and uh, this other second part is my grandmother she always keeps telling me that 25% to 15 to 25% of your salary should go to others she she coins this term like uh, in telugu we call it petti puttadam in the sense is basically you are you, it's an investment for you for your future lives rather it's like how you invest money to grow that's incredible yeah yeah, yeah. You, how how do you invest money for your future children or for your future right it's similar to investing money for your future lives so that's kind of those are some things that which stuck to me i came to the us in 2007 for my masters i did in electrical engineering i finished it in one year and distinction and then i started doing my jobs so the plastic part of it came later but by default i always love to hike so i was very i would say i was very close to nature i always hated going to the cities so yeah. even from the from my childhood i yeah. even in the us if you ask me i would have gone to a lot of national parks but i've hardly visited any big cities i i i am not a concrete guy <laughs> i would say uh, like i so that's i, I mean i don't like those so i like i prefer to be close with nature so in in india as well as here in the us so yeah, super yeah that's that i would say that might be the seeds of why i kind of changed or why i moved into this entrepreneurship yeah and in the in the us i did my masters and then i i worked in like about 3 to 4 semiconductor industry so in the job, I'm, I'm actually going to get to that so i'm going to i'm going to intervene because okay. because i want to dive deeper into your hard work yeah. so i don't want yeah, you to yeah. skip that because sure. that's a really important part yeah. it's just a couple of funny things that came to my mind uh, one is petty puttadam sounds also like you know put down yes. petty cash yes. kind of thing yes. which is which is so interesting yes. because uh, you know i also didn't know that yeah. uh, telugu term uh-huh. uh, the other interesting thing that you were talking about spirituality and they always say in india mm-hmm. the gods come from the north down <laughs> and the teachers come from the south up <laughs> and uh, teachers are always greater than god that's yeah, what yeah. you know we always say in india yeah. so so that's so interesting mm-hmm. to hear of, of your inclination towards mm-hmm. spirituality and reading and of course there's so much uh, richness there mm-hmm. so i actually want to jump where you were going yeah. uh, and and talk about your work and i know that you sort of really worked hard and in the shark tank mm-hmm. uh, which we'll get to mm-hmm. a little later you also talk about you know working from 7 pm to 2 am yeah. every day mm-hmm. so obviously you were doing another job yep, during yep. the day I'm, i still, so still just, do another just, job just, I, i still do another yeah job. i know yeah, i know yeah. so, so so just just stay with uh, how you know the 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 day job you know what were the day jobs uh, that you were doing and you know like what what was keeping you busy and what was keeping your bank rolling so okay so. okay yeah so sure. actually there is some kind of un, uh, unintentional preparation that went on when i was young so one thing is my mom wanted me to do a lot of things when i was like a kid so for me school was not just the school or the homework from the school or you know exams in the school was not just the part of it she made me woke me, woke me up at 5:30 made me study hindi in the morning like like a tuition you call it tuition or site adjacent i would say like extra curricular right and then in the evening after i came back from school i had a piano and then i had something else so i was like from kind of since i remember i've al- always been busy most of the extra hours in my life i mean i had my play time and all that stuff but that doesn't mean that i didn't do that but yeah so it was always extended it was not like oh just this so 
I, she kind of did this because I didn't, they didn't, she didn't want me to waste time on TV and, and all that stuff. So I, I did have a TV time, but it's like limited. So that kind of prepared me. I would say that disciplined approach kind of prepared me or helped me. So like coming back to that, uh, the same thing in the US, right? When I came to the US, when I finished my master's and I moved into my job, like I, I went into Sandus as a design engineer for like a man flash technology. I'm a huge fan of electronics and VLSI before, like before, Sha- before Incredible Eats or while Incredibles. So uh, when I got my job, I was so bored. After five, what do I do? I went and played. I mean, but I mean, master's was just one year. So I had to slog anyways. So that, that was different. But once I started my job, I'm like, my mornings are free and my evenings are free. What do I do? Then I, I, I was like, it was feeling bored to be frank. I mean, I had friends. I used to play volleyball and basketball and sometimes soccer and all that stuff. But that was only like one or two hours. But after six or seven, what do I do? So that was my point, right? Then I signed up. I always wanted to do martial arts, but my mom didn't let me because I had two younger brothers. She was always worried that I'll kick them when I was young. So, so I was like, okay, this is the time I can go do martial arts. I did martial arts. I got like black belts and a couple of uh, taekwondo and eskrima and all that stuff in like three years after my job. And then even then I was bored. Then I went, learned golf. Even then I was bored. Then I did something else. So I was always keeping ex- extending my, I would say the regular nine to five or, you know, the regular life because I was always feeling yeah. bored because I was, that's how I was used to it from, from the beginning. So, uh, yeah, so you, did you, did you, were you married and had a child then? Or? No, no, no. That was before marriage, <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, that was just, I, I just got a job and I, even my, my martial arts, I completed one year after marriage. After that, I didn't continue. Because once my kid came, I, I didn't have time to do all that. Yeah, you're right. So that, that things have changed later on. Yeah. And so I've been working and then uh, I, by the way, I graduated during the recession in 2008, uh, 2000, I graduated in December, 2008, even with a distinction, I couldn't get a job for like eight months because 2009 was the recession time. So I, in fact, the sad thing that happened was when I was about to graduate, I already had a job verbally, but that job got frozen or they didn't open it for the next five, six months. I like, that's fine. Five to six months is absolutely fine. I'll go have fun. But then uh, in the fifth month or a sixth month, they uh, they canceled that offer or they canceled that requisition. I was like, and at that time, this was in 2007-8, we didn't have, in the US, once you graduate, you only have 12 months to get a job. Otherwise, you are kicked out of India, uh, of the US. So I was also being prepared. I tried, but there were no jobs at all. And it was a struggle. To be frank, I would say that 12 months were my toughest in my life. Because the reason is, it's not because I didn't get a job or I didn't have the money. The B reason is, I did not know how to be idle the whole day. I just told you what my life was before and after, right? So I was always over-occupied. And, but those 12 months without a job, always trying for a job and not doing anything. And obviously, to do something else, also I need money. If I'm not having money, how can I do something else, right? So it was the hardest because I had to sit idle. But in, a, in another in unintentional way, uh, life always gives you something else, right? That's when I read whatever books I can. I read whatever. I actually watched a lot of documentaries. I read a lot of articles because I, was, I didn't have, I have a lot of time what to, what to do, right? You can't, I mean, obviously preparing for interview, you can only do it for a few hours a day or supply, applying for jobs. But the rest of the hours, what do I do? I can't do outside, anything outside, which costs me money. I was just stuck with my laptop at a home. I, I used to stay in a small room near my with my seniors. Thanks to them, they didn't even ask me a rent. So I was like just stuck there in a small room and just for myself. And I read a lot. And that's one of the first time when I read about plastic pollution and climate change and you know, into that foray and all that stuff. But yeah, I was also prepared to come back to India. I wanted to do some like civils or you know, IAS and, and that stuff. I because I thought this is not working out, even with so much struggle and all that stuff. Maybe US is not place for me. That's when I thought, okay, let me just be prepared to go back and do something there. And that's when I thought, but fate has changed the way it's supposed to go. Just one month before I was planning to come back, I got a job in one of the companies and I stayed. So, nice. yeah, and I stayed, I got a job in Sandusk uh, and so I'm, I'm into VLSI. We make, uh, I mean, I kind of lead the, com- like right now I lead a team in Intel, which makes Xeons, the server chips. So, yeah, and again, so I started how, that's how I started. And then I continued my work. I got married in 2012 and it, can, it went on and coming to, and I had my son in 2014 and then my daughter in 2018. And right after that, okay, this is all regular engineer life. Like, just mowing jobs and all that stuff, regular engineered life. 
and 2018 uh, around july august time frame uh, i just went to an ice cream i mean all these files i still read a lot of articles i mean i hiked as i mentioned right i'm, I'm again i'm again going to stop you sure, because sure, i sure. want that to be a separate story sure, sure. <laughs> the ice cream story is an important yeah, yeah, part yeah, 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 yeah. okay <laughs> but yeah but go ahead and if you want to add more to no your job, one because... thing i wanted to add is while i was working i i love to travel especially to the um, national parks us has amazing national parks i knew that before so i in fact the reason i came to the us is to do that just go look around the nature not because of my earning money that everyone finds that an uh, unacceptable reason but yeah apart from money i would say money is okay but money wise i wanted to explore the terrains here there's a huge amount of terrains that you can experience here and uh, i i looked in like i went to all the national parks i hiked about three out of the five highest peaks in the us I was big into hiking, rock climbing, and all these other activities. Uh, Super. And I'm sure that connects you to mm -hmm. nature so much more. Just for the listeners yeah. who don't understand the civil services, it's the Indian administrative services yeah. that actually basically are the bureaucrats uh, in India. So just clarifying that for the listeners. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so I actually wanted you to talk a little more about that profound moment of realization and you were just getting there and I yeah, had yeah. to sort of stop you because I wanted that to be a separate uh -huh. sort of thought process and you know this whole idea which created this mm -hmm. thought in you that you need to do something different so so yeah just talk uh, about it and yeah it'll be great to hear yeah sure uh, so yeah as I mentioned in 2018 uh, at a point of like in July August time frame I went to an ice cream shop with my son and uh, just just had an ice cream uh, they they typical right they give you a cup a paper cup and the plastic spoon and i had my ice cream actually a week before that i read an article about plastic pollution and all that stuff uh and it was just there fresh in my mind i was not too much thinking about it or anything but when i had that ice cream and then i threw the spoon like i just looked into the bin and they're like hundreds of it's a famous ice cream shop in that area so they're like about hundreds to 500 about ice just the spoons and cups so many of them there and that's when uh, a question struck me well, that I was an educated person. I read a lot about climate change and like, like plastic pollution and all that stuff. My question that came to me is I knew things, but why are my actions not reflecting what I know? It's as simple as that. I, I, I knew that it hurts or harms the environment, but why was I okay to use it just because someone is giving it to me? Okay. And there are two more things that came into the play. When, when I thought about it, that, when that question struck me, I thought about it. I was actually investing in a couple of small startups, office startups, one in India, one in the US and all that stuff, like typical engineering thing. And then I wanted to invest in, you know, uh, into startups and all that stuff. And the second thing is I noticed 99% of the people are starting entrepreneurship based on like a software or a hardware or a service or something like that. But I have not seen, especially, I mean, I might be wrong too at the time. And like, I know they have seen a lot of good, good people working on something good, good things, but at least I have not seen any focus on the planet or, you know, all the things uh, that we're supposed to work on as well. The right now, the ESG is the new term of the, or, or I would say new, new uh, high of these uh, investments and all that stuff. But at least at the time I was like, why are people not starting something that can in turn help the planet? forget about making money but at least if you don't do or do not it still helps the planet rather than hurting the planet so these two things kind of combine and i had oh, as by the way at that point of time i was also wanted to i wanted to do an mba in one of these unit like stanford or even berkeley and all that stuff so i was also trying to do that so there these things happened at the same time then uh, i realized okay why don't we start well, why don't i start something to help uh, counteract plastic pollution i had two big threats right climate change and plastic pollution climate change i always uh, at least it was a little bit talked to in the sense people were talking about it people were feeling the heat waves they're feeling the tornadoes or cyclones or you know the climate changes that people feel it right they phys physically feel it and they know that there's a problem but one thing i realized on plastic pollution is people don't feel it uh, if they really feel it every day they wouldn't be using that much plastic as simple as that it's 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 hidden underneath this uh, something uh, or at least in the us because they, they keep it so clean you won't even see trash bins and like you know trash mountains and all that stuff but again they ship it off to asia and asia is getting polluted i'm i'm, I'm not going to say that they're doing a good job but what i'm trying to say is 
it's it's hidden and people are not worried about it and that's when i thought okay let me find some alternatives and start something based on plastic pollution on tackling plastic pollution and the second reason why i wanted to start apart from doing something good on entrepreneurship hs remember i told you i want to do an mba right at the same time i realized the mba costs you around 140 to 150000 dollars in a prestigious university in, in the us i thought that's a lot of money and in the end even if i finish my mba i i don't know if i if i will you know that's a different thing right it's like i don't know if i'll go to get back the worth that i have that i invested in it and all that stuff and also it won't give me practical experience so i realized okay let me spend that money in a company which i want to start and learn myself and maybe that is equivalent to an mba or you know even more than that because it's a practical experience so that's the secondary reason and the third reason which is also very equally important is when i was researching about this plastic pollution i realized we are already consuming a credit card sized microplastics every week we are already consuming it in the air we breathe in the water we drink in the food we eat especially if you're eating seafood there's a lot of microplastics that you are consuming without knowing and and uh, another uh, what scared me is my kids are small like right now they're 9 year old and a 5 year old if they grow up let's say after 20 years if it's going to surely increase if you don't stop our plastic consumption how bad will their life be so that is one of the actually one of the very important reasons for me the reason is let's say if i make a lot of money they have pretty good comfortable life but what's the point if they can't eat their food or drink their water it comes back to the yeah, basics incredible. yeah it comes yeah. back to the basics so that that disturbed yeah. me i'm like everyone is following I mean, again this I, i don't want to claim something is right or wrong like it's, it's beyond me but i'm trying to think that okay let's start something let make let's make a dis- difference right let's for me i always look at the best case worst case scenarios best case yeah things go well i make money and also save the planet worst case i won't make money i lose all the money that i invest in on the time i invested in but still i'm making an impact so impact wise it doesn't matter if i lose or win i'm still gonna do the impact that i wanted to do so that was an easy equation for me yeah yeah and uh, i don't know if you you probably definitely saw it and i know that you went mm-hmm. into uh-huh. spoons and edible spoons at that uh, at one point uh, one of the videos that went viral in around the same time you were thinking about it was a company from andhra pradesh yeah, called yeah. bakeys yeah, from yeah. narayan pisapati and uh, narayan did an incredible job of that little video well he or whoever did it mm-hmm. and it really went viral and people were talking all about it yeah, because yeah, yeah. we were in the sustainable packaging business there were so many people who forwarded it to me and then yeah. i ended up having a few conversations yeah. with narayan yeah. and it was yeah. 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 Uh, wonderful he was such a nice technocrat and mm-hmm. i don't know i mm-hmm. don't know if you are in touch with him no i was but uh, I what was, was that yeah, yeah was yeah. that something that influenced you as well in your in your thinking not exactly so okay once i realized i want i want to find alternatives to plastic i did my research right i first figured out what alternatives that exist most of the alternatives at least i saw in the market talking about what is in the market not what is in r and d right what is in the market it was uh, compostable which is basically based out of pla which is corn and uh, you know the sugarcane based bagasse based and the second thing uh, is bamboo cutlery or paper cutlery paper cutlery did not exist for the spoons especially more, mostly for straws right one thing i realized I, then i thought okay compostable exists then why is is it good or not that's when i researched then i realized most 90% of the composting cutlery that exists in the market if you throw it in the la- tra- trash can or in a landfill it doesn't do the good it will it is half better than plastic so i'm not going to say that the life cycle is as bad as plastic but still it won't do the entire good but one thing i learned is recycling is itself is very bad in the us they hardly recycle and composting is even worse and i spoke to a couple of composting facilities and i was in california at that time uh, so when i spoke to california is actually one of the very progressive states in respect to sustainability and all that when i spoke to one of the famous composters there he he openly told me he, they divert all the cutlery back to landfill i'm like why if people and the city is doing a job to you know do separate out compostables to give you something why their biggest challenge is sorting out you can't guarantee that there's no uh, like plastic or some other you know things that's going to come with you and cutlery is too small to separate it out if it's like a big clamshell or a takeout box or something it's much more easier to figure out which is not what but cutlery is not similar it's it's hard so i realize that even 
if even if there is a composting facility that exists if that's not doing the thing that we are we're expecting it to do then why are we paying extra or why are we even using these so that was the reason why i thought okay it doesn't work out again i'm only talking about good cities right like let's come to east coast not i don't except for new jersey i don't think there's any other composting facility in the entire east coast belt very few very few which exists so that, that that's something that disturbed me i thought okay then forget it it, it doesn't work out that way then I looked into other bamboo, and actually, I think I went met one of the manufacturers of. Uh, there is a typical dif a different type of bamboo that exists in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. I did a lot of work on it. It took me almost one year uh, to find what alternatives that exist and all that stuff. There, there is a different type of bamboo which grows really fast. Generally, bamboo takes time, right? It does. It doesn't. It doesn't have very good cycles of growth, and uh, you can can't use it that much. There is a typical type of bamboo which grows near the ocean which goes really fast and you can use it as for straws. You just cut it and use it as a straw. So no processing, nothing involved. So, and I looked into other cutleries and all that stuff. And one thing about bamboo, which I found out, the regular bamboo I'm talking about, I'm not talking about these straws, which are like directly from the nature. Even though bamboo cutlery is biodegradable, there's a huge chemical process that in, involves to make that product, to convert pulp to something that you can stamp into a cutlery and all that. And that chemical waste pollutes rivers. It's not a simple natural process you, like magic. You take cut from a tree and then make it into a cutlery. So I have explored all this. I read this book called uh, Cradle to Cradle. I don't know if you're aware of it. So a lot of times when we buy things, we only observe. Bill, Bill was the Bill, the writer was yeah. the first guest on this. Podcast. Oh, nice, nice. So, I don't have to make any introduction. You need so. to look it up. You need <laughs> yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. He's one of our mentors. As nice. well. Oh, nice, nice, nice. So that that's when I real. I, that's a very good book that I felt. I even made me realize in in my my regular products. Forget about cutlery, right? Like right now, I only have one uh, suite or like a like a vest or tuxedo which I got for marriage. I didn't get anything after that. I use that for every time I go anywhere. So I, and I, I, it also keeps, keeps me fit, right? I mean, I don't have to, I don't want to gain weight if I can't use it again. So it in a, indirectly it helps me. And I, I am a very minimalist. Um, something my wife hates sometimes is like, if we buy something new, we have to give away something else that we have. Very, very limited. If whatever we need only we buy. If we don't need, we're not buying anything. So um, in that way, it's very minimalism that, that that book helped me be that. And also understand that don't just look at about after life of a product, but also the life before it. So those things kind of help me also in a way. So all these things together, I, I at that time only came across Bakey's. I thought, okay, this idea is amazing. It's huge. This I, And it's actually very sensible if you see, because coming back to my ice cream shop, there was a cone which is replacing a cup. As simple as that. It was the solution was right in front of me. Like if, but there is no cutlery which can replace a plastic spoon which you can eat. So when obviously when I looked at edible cutlery at the time, Narayan's uh, bakeries did show up. So he was the first person I contacted. I actually uh, asked uh, asked him to see if I can bring it to the US. But around that time, uh, maybe a little later, I don't exactly remember. But he also had someone in the US who was planning to bring that cutlery to here. They raised some Kickstarter, but they couldn't uh, deliver the product. And later, again, I can't vouch for the, you might know better than me at this aspect because you already worked with him or at least you had conversations with him. He couldn't continue because he couldn't scale. And in fact, I offered help saying that I'm an engineer by background. Maybe I can be of help to scale it. And it somehow didn't work out. I don't want to get into details and all that stuff. Then, then I realized, okay, that's fine. Then let me just hold off because that product is already there. Let it come into the market. Let it do the good that it's supposed to. But then it didn't go well. I don't, I don't know all the reasons I heard from here and there, from the news and from all that stuff, but I, it didn't work out. And the reason why I realized it worked out was they didn't have the scalability. So this some this is one of the comments that I get. I know a lot of Indian people might be listening to this. Indians, uh, a lot of people say or claim that we copied the idea. Okay, I am still going to credit the originality of edible cutlery to him. I'm not going to accept that or de 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 declare that. But what we did was we invented the machine that makes it. So when I mention a lot of times when I, in my Shark Tank comments, I see people saying, how can he claim it's the world's first? Ed? I said world's first mass manufacturable edible cutlery. I did not say world's first. No, and, and that's that's also the niche where yeah. innovation lies. People yeah. can, somebody can create something, yeah. but then, you know, there is somebody else who takes it and makes it something that can actually scale. 
Yeah. And that's in itself a huge innovation. And most of the people that we talk about today in terms of innovation, you can look at Apple. Mm -hmm. They're not the first who created yeah, uh, iPhone, like, iPhone, like iPhone. the iPod, yeah, iPhone, iPhone, you yeah, know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, the, but the idea is that they could take the idea and build it. So, so yeah, totally like kudos goes to you. And yeah. not, uh, not anyone no, it, it's, it's fine. I, I, I'm, I'm open to that, right? I have to be uh, like transparent there also. So even from, for us, right, when we started the machine, it's actually very exciting. In 2008, and like early 2019 is when we figured out this machine. Okay, this is where my partner comes in. Kruvil Patel is from Gujarat and Baroda, Vadodara. Uh, I met, I, I found out through some like common connections that he was also working on some machinery to make edible cutlery possible. And I met him. I actually, I took my paternity leave from and went across India. Not just cutlery. There are some other interesting products I looked into. I didn't, it didn't bring it to the market, unfortunately. But that's that. There are other things also about like how to replace a plastic bag at a grocery store, and there are some innovative things I can talk about it later. So I met Kruvil, and he was also on the same path to find the machinery to scale it up or to to you know invent uh, to to edible cutlery. And he's actually a mechanical engineer. I would I would credit like ninety percent of the machinery work to him rather than me. I I helped him in some design specs and uh, the thickness and the flavors and all those things. Mostly the design specs like the shape and the size of the spoon and the hardness and all that stuff. But the the machinery work ninety percent was his his efforts. I would I would completely put put it to him. And the thing biggest concern was the money, right? We are start. We just started something. It's not that we are like coming from rich families or have a lot of money. So we just started something. We had some ideas. We had that machine. I remember he. I had it. Like we finally figured out one particular mold or a different a set. How how we, how we can make it. And at the time we could make like around twenty to thirty per day. That's it. Or maximum hundred if you have like maybe two shifts or something. You can make maximum. And it was like in a very small place. I would I would even call it like an apartment or a small space. Okay, it's not even like a big place. Then I thought, okay, it's something's working out. I really liked what came out of it. And then decided, okay, let's me, let me introduce it to the US. Now I come back to the US. For me, the biggest challenge is this is completely a new industry. I have no experience in the food industry. I have no experience in sales. I'm just an engineer doing some engineering work before. So I wanted to first learn, forget about pitching the product. I wanted to learn. So I realized, okay. Anyone goes to Google or try to find some courses which on food industry, but I couldn't find anything because that's a very traditional industry. It's, now it's getting more technically, you know, um, smart. But before, it was mostly very traditional. People still call. At initially, when I emailed, hardly I got replies. Like, why are the people not responding emails? Because they like calls. They're more traditional in this in that aspect. So I I went to a trade show. I signed up for a trade show. Uh, that was like four thousand dollars or something to get a booth in in the trade show. I just called them. It was like two weeks before the trade show. I figured out that there's a trade show exists in, in New Orleans. I called them up and said, hey, I'm very new. I'm not even new to this industry, but I still want to bring, go have a booth there and talk to people and get some idea and all that. They like they were very kind enough and they gave me like a, a 1500 or something, almost like one third of the price of the booth. I went there with my suitcase and I just had a few small samples of the products and I just printed out some information on my home printer. I went there. I saw all these fancy booths. That's my first time going into a trade show. And my booth was empty. There was nothing there. There was no carpet, no table, no chairs, nothing. It was just empty. I didn't even know that I had to go purchase them or rent them out. I was first time, right? But I figured out, I spoke to them and I said, uh, at least give me a carpet. It won't look, <laughs> if you don't have a carpet, everyone else is having a carpet. Put a carpet there. And they, I asked them what's the cost for like the table and chairs and some, like they're like, it was ridiculous. It was quite expensive. I just went to Walmart, got a table and a chair, and I put it there. And uh, and I just I didn't have a banner, nothing. I didn't even know how to go there. Right? It was like very new for me. The point was to meet people and understand. And I went uh, and I started talking to people. I just like asked asked them a lot of questions and learned everything. It was three days. I learned a lot. I basically I wanted to understand what a wholesale cost distribution and how the industry works, what's the cost that it would work and all that stuff. It's a catering event. A lot of caterers comes there. Uh, and one guy in the last day, he came to my table and said, uh, Dinesh, what is the best cost that you could give me? I was like, uh, I, at that time it was 40 cents a piece. It's quite expensive actually. I told him Mac, best I could do is like 30 cents. I can't go below, below that. Then he, came, he told me on the table, I'll order 150,000 spoons on this table right now. If you give it to me at 25 cents. And I said, yes. 
at, at this point i did i have i only had a small i only had a small place where i can make 20 or 30 spoons a day it was so i i, I was scared i was like what do i do that's my first sale i didn't even come to sell there i wanted to learn things first so that was my first order i came back home i told my wife i'm selling my home i had a home in california at the time uh, we sold our home used that money to scale up our facility and within 6 months we fulfilled that order that's how the journey started of me that's actually incredible. physically sell, selling the product and uh, I, yeah that's a, yeah and that's go, such an inspirational story yeah and going on i went to a lot of trade shows i won a lot of awards something again being an indian that helped me especially in the us is my dad told me when i started this business when we don't have that much money i didn't even think about investments at that time that was like way far fetched uh, when i started on my own with my own money when i sold my home and all that stuff he said please value your ex- expenditure in rupees rather than in dollars so that kind it's, of your, that, your dad is your dad is a wise man i also liked his earlier yeah, you referred to where the happiness is inside <laughs> yeah so the, actually that so helps are important lessons that helped me a lot because whenever someone comes to me with a service and say oh there's only 3 3000 per month you will you will increase your revenue and all that stuff i'm like that's a lot of money it's one and a half lakh for me so i i, I immediately converted and i want to make because i well, ro matters 240 and yeah, now it's 000, yeah and now it's 240 <laughs> no longer yeah. 150000 yeah at that time i'm talking about like 4 years back but yeah still and uh, the, that's when i realized okay i have to really be scrutinize everything i spend on so even if i all the tra- i went to like my last show i'm mean, at least my my expected last show is next week with that show it will be like around 22 shows that i've been to uh, all these shows i always choose the cheapest hotel if there are hostels i stay in hostels uh because it's all my money in the end right i have to be careful i have a family i have like my wife and my two kids and i have to be careful i only could spend what i could save literally nothing more than that that's amazing so, such an inspiration i'm yeah. sure that will take you a long way frugality is always good yeah. in uh, business uh, but just just before you sort of move more on the side uh-huh. of marketing mm-hmm. i wanted to talk a little more of the process you said you could produce 20 to 30 spoons then you created some machinery with your co-founder what is the production level now number 1 number 2 uh-huh. what is the basic ingredients that uh, you are mm-hmm. using mm-hmm. and what are the binders so those three things good question and i wanted to emphasize here so cruvel i mean all he needed was some money so i pumped that money um, through my home sale and uh, we scaled up a little bit at the time to meet that order we immediately ordered the machines and all that stuff the technology was already taken care of right it's mostly uh, getting that information getting the product into the factory we leased a space and right now it's un- manufactured under the name of trishula so it's cruvel is the ceo of that company and i'm also a partner there and he's also a partner here in incredible eats so again a lot of times people ask I, people still send me messages hey let's bring this to india i'm like it's made in india man so you know it's not that it's not uh, it's like you as i'm bringing it from india i'll come come to the other aspects of the transport and all that later but yeah coming back to your point right now we can make up to 30 to 40000 spoons per day in one shift the main uh, ingredients are uh, wheat oat chickpea corn and brown rice it's basically the multi grain atta that we find in india and uh, there are no binders it's just water yeah uh, atta is atta is flour for the listeners yeah 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 for flour yes yes yeah we don't have any specific chemical binders or anything it's just basic flours and water I can't go details. It's more patented, and the patent is still pending right now. But the 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 way it kind of compresses and bakes it at the same time in a very fast way. So that's how we kind of figure out the strength. And that's not the end story, by the way. I only started with that. Once I brought to the market, one thing I learned from I would say Daniel Lubetsky, the the owner of Kind, which who who sold it recently, and he's also one of the shark I met in Shark Tank. he had this very nice statement which is very engineering like i would say inclined towards engineering mindset by the way it's basically every startup has to go through three c's one is create criticize and then crusade so it's like how in engineering when i design something i test it and then i release it into production right but a lot of people try to skip it because they get too much fame or too much you know into it so you wouldn't believe even if i had the oppor- I, even though i had some opportunities now i feel it's a bad mistake that i did but still it's fine i intentionally sold less to get feedback first because 
I am not selling something that exists in the market. Like, let's say if I'm selling a new flavor of ice cream, that's easy, right? I have the market data. I have at least people talking about what they need, what are their like, like likes and dislikes and all that stuff. But I'm bringing something which is completely new. People do not know what an edible spoon should taste like or feel like. So if I didn't have the data, I couldn't, I didn't want to spend more to scale it or sell a lot initially because that will disturb me later on. Yeah, it's, it can, it's a, it's a viral thing, right? It's like a very innovative, unique thing. So it, it can catch on. But then I was afraid that if it catches on and then becomes the wrong reason for not being used, then I'm afraid then it might not work out. So we revised the product three times. Uh, that, that's where it was the hardest thing to do because I, I want to make sure people like it. We would like to take a minute to thank our sponsors. Good Garbage is sponsored by PACA, a family of brands that produces compostable packaging and works to implement regenerative solutions. PACA's new project is to bring compostable food service ware and food carry products to the North American marketplace. Learn more at PACA.com. Now back to the conversation. On Shark Tank, you talk about the cost being about 10 cents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, if I look at uh, the overall raw material cost and you think about the weight that you're putting in the raw material, I'm just thinking, I'm just extrapolating on how it can scale. So, yeah. so you know, so the idea that, you know, if you were to make million pieces a day, would the, would the variable cost, uh, basically variable cost will remain the same, the fixed cost going down. Do you think there's a significant change that will happen or there is no. a basic cost that will remain? Yeah, it, then, it, know, can't can't as, about it can't be a straightforward answer. It can't be as cheap as plastic because plastic is a spy product. Right? It's, it's a spy product. It's a different. So you have the raw material cost that will be your final say on what it would be. But what we initial analysis is if let's say if, uh, if there's someone orders like a 10 million per year or something like that, the lowest that we could go is like in cents after the shipping and everything is about eight to nine cents per spoon. So that's the lowest we could go uh, because, again, as I mentioned, a lot of factors involved there, right? Uh, right now, we are at 15. We already brought it down. We are at 15 right now, 15 cents per spoon. So, um, but but again, there are some other challenges with respect to shipping in the US and all that stuff. So there are all these things, other things that come into play rather than the pure product cost. Yeah, I was just thinking about if, if it was to scale, would no, the cost yeah. come down? And you're right, you're saying that, you know, it might come down to you know that kind of level but but that still means there yes. is a basic eight cent cost that will remain yep, yep, yep. you can't you can't do it that's that's the variable cost that will happen yeah there. and and another thing is we are only guessing that number right now because maybe it can be better but once we didn't go into that scale and run it and see it right right now we're still in that ten thousand like a twenty thousand thirty thousand scale we're not into that hundred thousand scale so again it depends on the scale and everything and there are a lot of capital costs involved right and by the way um yeah i don't know to release a surprise what happened after shark tank but it'll come there no, I do want to talk about Shark Tank, but just before we do that, and that, that we can pivot there next, but uh, you also talk about it being a carbon negative company, which mm -hmm. is very impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also see the, the, obviously, there is a certain amount of energy that probably is taken in the process, and then we ship it across the world to mm -hmm. US. Yep. So how do you, and I, your website talks about it beautifully, but for listeners, you know, like, how do you how do you make it into a carbon negative company uh, with that process? Yeah, sure. Um, so again, the the underlying thing was I wanted to make sure that a lot of times I observed not just food industry, any industry, people want to make money first and then think about the planet next. And it always so there's a fight between doing the right sustainability thing versus making money, and it still happens. If you look at all these big chains, it's it's you won't see the immediate change there because there's a lot of things that are involved there. So on our side, I felt that when, once I started selling the product, I want to make sure that it doesn't have any footprint as much as it can. So initially, we were only carbon neutral and plastic neutral. And the way we did it was uh, we using third parties. We, can, we couldn't do it ourselves. It's a lot of math and a lot of uh, information that we had to provide. So we provided all the manufacturing information, the shipments, the my, number of miles of spoon travels and, and, um, and, and like within the US and from India to the US and also everything right even let's say a pallet is wrapped in plastic because it's a food product we can't avoid it i didn't want to but then i was forced to 
So there are these some some specular things. Even though in packaging we don't use any plastic, but at least in, in the transportation we have to, right? And let's say on. Have app, you managed to remove the thin layer that you had of PE on your paper? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's now it's PE, yeah, it's, it's, but it's still PLA, a bit of PLA. Still, it's still, yeah, 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 still yeah, industrially yeah. compostable. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. No, actually, yeah, no. You're at least no, trying, no, you're the trying. mic. It's a, it's two microns, so uh, sometimes it's, it's except. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's not that bad. Okay. Yeah. you're trying and yeah. that's what matters yes and uh, coming back to this yeah so we we went to this company called uh, uh, green print uh, and they actually offered that service to calculate how much it would cost per spoon that we have to pay and they pay it to the third party providers to provide us that carbon and plastic neutral and negative we went a, went a little beyond once we scaled on the cost of the product we could do a little more than that and that's how i mean for example all the emissions that are created we compensate with uh, with with, uh, with not just about planting trees that's something that everyone says but we went beyond that and finding infra like for example in some villages in india there are these companies which we which this green print company works with where they convert all coal based electricity to solar based or wind based electricity so like they do that and that's how you get the credits and say hey okay this this is what you have done for what you did according to your product and they provide us that entire mathematical equations on how much per spoon that i have to pay in order to get rid of that and and mm -hmm. coming back to plastics how can you be plastic negative right that's a big question everyone asks uh, so uh, like we calculate how much plastic is used during transportation one of the biggest challenges in in us amazon even though we ask them to not use bubble wrappers or you know any of these uh, other plastic items you can't control them they're too big for you to listen to you so we ask uh, we did we they try to but i don't know how much they can they work on so we try to we also include that plastic usages when we pack through our 3pl we don't use any plastic we even the even the tape is water based uh, uh, paper tape so uh, all those things we when it's under control we take care of it but if it's an amazon's control they are so we calculate all this and what they do is they work with other providers especially in indonesia and some of these places where the plastic is moving from rivers to the oceans and they stop it at the at the entry point into the oceans and they convert into something like benches and all these like like typical recycling right so they and also one i remember supporting one project where they go to the Pacific garbage patch, pick the plastic out from there and recycle it. So that quantity is what gives you that plastic neutral or plastic negative statement. Yeah, and it's just the thought that you have that inclination. But what I also see is that uh, like you are, of, of course, doing a full time job and then doing yeah. this on the side. So, of course, you're not earning and you've made that very bold statement that till you don't say, replace what is it 100 million 100 yeah, million yeah, pieces yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah if you don't replace 100 million pieces you're not going to take a penny yeah. but then of course you can also do that because you are holding another yeah. job of course you're mm -hmm. working yourself out but that's a different yeah. thing what about your co-founder does he also have a separate source of income no and no. that's how he supports or is he at least earning through He's, this uh, yeah yeah maybe? so in india trishula is a well well established company in Varadara. so uh uh, we made sure that when I buy a product from him, it's at cost plus a small margin so he can sustain his family, his company and like his employees because there are employees there, right? See, my point is different for sales and marketing. I don't need one, many people. I literally, I can actually explain that later. In the last three months, I completely switched my virtual assistants to AI. I'll, I can tell you that later. Right now, even though I'm talking with you, I have machines running behind to talking to uh, approaching people uh, coffee shops on instagram and all that stuff so yeah i again coming back to frugality right i'm trying to cut down costs from my side i didn't really bother because i had a job and and even though i sold my home i i'm renting and my job my salary from my job takes care of my life so some people didn't like that especially investors because i was not full-time but i felt especially when my goal is to make the impact not to make money it gave me a good comfort zone especially on the family right imagine if i'm at a stage where i quit my job and i'm really looking for money all the time then i wouldn't be this plastic negative or you know carbon negative i'll be like let me get that that those pennies and put it in my salary you know that i would have thought the other way around yeah, that's what they say. The first uh, S of sustainability is also, yeah. you know, to make sure yeah. that you're surviving. Because if you're not surviving, then yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. You can you can at least support it uh, through uh, this. Yes. Yeah, but go on. 
Good. Yeah. So uh, yeah, coming back to that, yeah. So the the, the in in India, everyone is full time. Um, we have a pretty decent team. Uh, so and we also ship it to from Trishula. It goes to Germany on a different brand name with another distributor and all that stuff. So it's not just the US. Uh, I take care of US and Canada. Uh, North America mostly, and uh, there are some other distributors in Germany, and also we, we I also ship to Israel and Cyprus and some other countries. But again, it depends. We all like to gather. It's not that we are separate and all that. Yeah, that's amazing. So, so of course, and uh, like we discussed before, uh, you had an amazing and amazing experience, and mm-hmm. it's a beautiful episode of Shark Tank, and I encourage yeah. everybody listening to it to see it just for your smile, if nothing else, <laughs> because you're just such so affable yeah. in that uh, was... episode. That e- even if you are under pressure and your hands are together, you are still sort of smiling and yeah, you know, just yeah. have this energy. So it's just an incredible episode there. But I would love to know your experience overall and that how that changed and impacted your life. Okay. Yeah, it also started very interestingly. Remember, I told you in 2019, I went to a lot of these trade shows. I think I signed up for like five or six of them. Uh, in 2020, I went to this winter fancy food show. Uh, I had a booth there. And by the time I was making some decent sales every month through ice cream shops, we didn't go into retail. Retail is very later on. So it's mostly food service that we concentrated on. And that show, we won the best product in the show. And it was like in the first page of the show, pamphlets and all that stuff. We had a lot of good PR from there. And that's that caught the producer of Shark Tank to reach out to me in 2020. So, but I was on H1B. I'm, st- I'm, like, I'm still on, but I'm in very close stage to green card. But yeah, I was on H1B. So they said, we can't take uh, non-green cards or non-citizens. I'm like, okay, fine. I, I was like very excited, but then that's fine. It's something that I can't do anything about it. So I left it. I forgot about it. And COVID came. All my food service completely got stalled. I had to switch pivot to the retail. I can explain a little more later. And even there, right, I used my cousin who to design my boxes. And I we just would, read three or four books. We understood how to do packaging and we made our own packaging. Like all these very crucial... Because I searched for some agencies and like forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars, and that's a lot of money. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Anyway, so that's how I started. We got some good retail stores. We were in six hundred stores in 2020 and 2021 and 2022, a little bit. So like we went to completely into retail, stop food service, like at least paused. Now we are resuming it. Um, and uh, yeah, 2021 again they reached out because they said, "Are you? Do you get your green card right now?" Like, no, I got my EAD, not green card. Green card is the next stage. They're like, okay, fine. I think we'll accept EAD and they brought me in. Uh, it went through about four or five months of multiple. Uh, it's not the first round I skipped. There is this first round. Generally, people go to these uh, casting events where they go cast, like pitch the product and all. I skipped that because they reached out to me. I was lucky in that aspect. But after that, there are two more uh, rounds where you have to clear before you actually go into the tank. So those we cleared and they actually assign a producer to help you to prepare and all that stuff. They're pretty, pretty good. And you have to go through a ton of documents. I think the worst part about Shark Tank is you read about 100 to 200 pages of documents and sign them like ridiculous. Anyways, that's fine. <laughs> that's the minus thing. And Shark Tank, they, they tape in much early, even though the, because it, it's not live, right? So they tape in much early and I got called in July and, uh, Preparation wise, I didn't bother preparing. First of all, the reason is every, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention Jack. Uh, Jack joined six months after I started my business. So he's my partner in the US. So just two of us in the company since the beginning till the end. We don't have any other employees. And both of us have jobs. He also has his job. I uh, gave him only equity because he's been working with me. And uh, both of, uh, and since both of us took care of everything, we knew everything, right? I didn't have to prepare anything. Everything was on my top of my head because I have been doing all my work on myself. So the preparation part was not that big, but one thing which caught me off guard, again, it's a big experience. There's one of the places, first time I felt, they gave me a caravan, they put makeup on me, like, what is all this? Like that, that You see it in TV with, you know, celebrities and all that stuff, right? That was very, it was very interesting. I didn't expect that. I went there, this like, this is your caravan, go sit there and relax. Like, what is this? <laughs> like, it's very interesting, very nice. Before we go on to the tank. And uh, I was the second company to pitch in that season itself. So these guys are so fresh, all the four, all the five sharks. Generally, the end, when you go in the end, they're already tired they, you know, and they, they don't, they don't, I would say they wouldn't grill you that much. Now, I, I didn't know that I was the second company. I'm like, oh my God, that's a lot because they'll grill because they're very fresh that they're like just starting the season, right? 
so i i went there inside and it's a they they give you a tour initially how do you walk how do you go there and talk and all that stuff and they called me the second company i went in there um i was not nervous i i never had this uh, i always like public speaking going talking on stages and all that stuff so i never had that fear part at all but and i was confident with my numbers and i was very true a lot of times sometimes what happens is in shark tank they don't stop you anywhere once the cameras get rolling it's even though they do due diligence before like with respect to how much revenue you did or how much quick profits and all the stuff you did but during the show they don't stop you even if you num- put whatever numbers you want so i i didn't want to be all that because i knew that a lot of times companies don't go through the investments because they just hike their numbers and say hey i did this i did that for the tv perspective uh and i just put whatever numbers i did and i it went well the first 90 seconds they don't disturb you that's for you to pitch that's when you saw me and one thing uh, before i went i told myself no matter how much they grill you just keep smiling it at them so that's the reason why you see my smile so much there so and they did a very good job editing by the way i stammered a lot because it was not easy and i you won't you won't see me stammering there but i did stammer a lot yeah, there yeah there's no stammering at all when you yeah but <laughs> but the the one thing i was not prepared though which i was not expecting is all five of them will talk to you at the same time that was the most most hard thing that i could do the reason is i i am a person by nature i don't let others other people finish their sentences i just start immediately that's my nature I, okay and when i came to the us when i was doing my work life every time i felt bad when i did that and i tried to make myself not do that that much so i was training myself especially at work again indians might find it okay asians might find it okay but it, like generally other crowd will be like why is he not letting me finish my sentence so like it, it happens right those things happen to you when you're working so i i train myself not to you know be patient listen to the complete sentence before i talk and all that stuff and i go there it's the complete opposite they were not letting me fin- finishing my sentences i was yeah you could hear that even you know the arguments within them one is when is trying to pitch to well, yeah. one is trying to give you an offer and the other is trying to give you an offer at the same time it, so you can hear what they also. edited is only 10% of the of the i don't want to use weird words but the the weird stuff it's so exhausting because one shark will ask you a question you you try to answer it before you finish your third word the three more sharks will ask you with different questions i was like what let me speak at at a point i was so frustrated and like please stop let me finish my sentences i was so frustrated at a point like please let me finish it I, I, again i could I, i don't think i mentioned i sold my home and all that stuff there i told them but it was all edited out so the reason and i heard that they intentionally do it because they want to own the floor if you are owning the floor then you will not accept to their uh, deals that's that's how their meant it's like more like a behavioral economics kind of thing or behavioral uh, study uh, like uh, way of science, they, yeah. yeah yeah science of they, them trying to own you and them being the main people but i felt i was okay because all the numbers wise technology wise and all i had everything in my head so it was not like hard to mention but yeah, uh, yeah. the only thing that got cut I, it went on for like 90 minutes something that everyone doesn't know even though they show only 10 15 minutes the pitches happen minimum of 30 to maximum i think the maximum was 2 and a half hours mine was around 1 and a half hour 90 minutes so they grill you a lot it's not as easy or as nice as they show you in fact every shark tank person who pitches there has to go through a psych evaluation after the pitch to make sure you're okay to be going outside of the studio <laughs> you don't have ptsd it's that exhausting everyone wow. then everyone thinks it's, it's like one time opportunity of your life and all that stuff but it's actually very exhausting i remember jack was waiting outside he was like how was it i was like i hate this place <laughs> like, so it's it's so exhausting like uh, because the way uh, it's it's one one and a half hour not being able to complete your sentences is not a small experience i would yeah, say yeah yeah you can imagine yeah. it has to be exhausting so of course you yeah. know you get offered a deal but i'm also told that eventually you posted yeah. that that deal fell through so what yeah, was yeah. that like and what happened there yeah so as you as people might see that we got four offers then mark cuban went back and actually uh, 
I had 30 minutes special talk only with Mark Cuban. I think one of the things that they other everyone respects him so much. They don't they really interfere much with him. I think because he's the richest. I don't know. And this is my personal view. But uh, we we talked a lot about. He was very interested. I actually also wanted to go with him initially, uh, but then he was very focused on retail. I was more focused on you own a stadium, like you know, you own a like a. You, you own the Texas uh, food, sorry, basketball uh, team, right? I forgot the name. Sorry, it doesn't come to me right, right at the top of my head. But yeah, I wanted it to be in all the stadiums and arenas and all the food service sections. But he was focused on retail, so it didn't match well. Uh, and he was also asking for a lot more. Um, then Lori was very nice at the time. She really liked the product and, and she gave me the lowest. So I thought, okay, it makes sense. Just go with her. And I also knew that she had contacts with Starbucks. That's another reason why I already, I already did my homework on each of the sharks and how much value they bring to my company and all that stuff. So it finished. Then I got a call from, I think I met Lori's husband there itself. And then we, we spoke and what happens next. And I heard that her team will contact me and ask me all the documents and all the due diligence, right? It's, and any, everywhere. And on TV, they might sign up for something. But after due diligence, they, based on whatever new risks they see, they might change their deal. Or even sometimes startups also change the deal. It's either way. It doesn't have to be only them or you, okay? And it, it took about two to three months actually going through all the new documentations. You spoke, spoke, speak to her lawyers and all that stuff. You can't raise any money, you know, all that. There are like different clauses. And after two to three months, I got a call from the Shark Tank office itself and uh, they said they're going to air in October. One thing that really, really affected me in the wrong way is uh, I was being prepared to... Okay, what happened was when I took the spoons, I took the ones which you see behind the spoons I took to the shark tank or the third version of the spoons in market on my websites, the second version was being sold. So I wanted to make sure all my old versions got sold off before I start before the shark tank goes live. So I only sell the new versions. I was being prepared for it. Uh, we had to change the machines, right? Because the version is different. So I told Cruel and we, we were trying to change all the machines and all that stuff. They told me it will possibly air in February of 2022. That's what I was being prepared for. Again, they said they can't guarantee, they can't give me a date and all that stuff. I was preparing for that. October 1st, they called me and they said, October 21st is your air date. I was like, I was telling, begging them, please, please move. Because at wow, that time, that's a big shift. Yeah. I, I, I didn't have a product. I only had 10, 100 boxes with me, literally 100 boxes with me. And the machines were just getting ready. They're not even ready. They're not even installed in the factory yet. That, that was a huge pain for me. Like, no, 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 not, not in October. Like November, December, doesn't matter, not in October. But they didn't listen. And at that same, around the same time, uh, Lori calls me and she changed her terms. I can't disclose anything, unfortunately. Uh, so she changed uh, the terms because of claiming some additional risks in the company. I didn't like those terms, so I came, went back and told, changed my terms also and said, okay, let me meet you in the middle. And I told her, this is what we can do then, but she didn't like it. She wanted me to be on the, on her terms. And I didn't want to be that. I mean, I didn't want to give away. I can't explain, unfortunately, I can't disclose the numbers or anything like that. No, so no, I, and that's fair. That yeah. Ultimately, equity is expensive. You don't. No, no, it it's not about equity. equity. By the way, if it was equity, I didn't care much. See, remember, I was. I'm not in this for money, right? It's not about equity. So it's something else. I can't disclose that. Okay, so that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think she called me three days before it went on air, and I declined the offer. Unfortunately, uh, I was really hoping on her connections, and but that's okay. It's fine. And then yeah. it went. It went on air, um, and I was. I I just put everything as pre-orders. I, I didn't know what to sell. I didn't have product. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It but couldn't I, be in the similar scenario. I remember mm -hmm. bakeries also you could see, but you couldn't buy. Like it yeah, was literally yeah, like yeah, he yeah. had no production or he would put yeah. in things like, oh, you only, have, you have to buy that much. And you'd say, okay, I'll buy that much. And then also it will, yeah. it was just one of those. So, you know, you didn't want to have the same experience, but I want to jump forward and also I want to be cognizant of time. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, so thinking like, I know you've gone ahead recently and also had done a bigger deal, I think with dip in dots yeah. and uh, you know, how is that gone and how many spoons are you doing now? What does the future look like and how yeah. do you plan to scale? So, uh, yeah, Dependots, we partnership ha happened in June, June of, uh, just, sorry, January of 2022. And uh, it went well for six months. And then they got acquired by another company. And the new company 
it's not worried about plastic so it kind of stopped so it was very unfortunate so these, these are typical challenges oh my gosh i'm so sorry ship. to hear that no 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 <laughs> worries so worries so, but we are doing a mix of food service and uh, retail right now uh, we are we are fine i think we are we have about 10 to 12 grand of revenue per month no ads we have not spent anything on marketing it's all organic yeah that's incredible i see that yes yeah, hardly and, any expenditure but there are good some good news is also we just got one thing i can announce right now we just got permission yesterday we will be in iceland airlines in the in the in flight meal for the children and we are also starting in a couple of theme parks in las vegas uh, in in few weeks so we are already in some aquariums and zoos across the us and some ice cream shops and some cafes uh, we launched the edible straws uh, through another company in india and we are also working on straws in trishula but right now we are working with the norm another company in india so we we introduced those straws they got some good uh, good 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 reviews as well and we are like we already spoke to wendy's and burger king but they are taking their own time i can't claim but yeah, but just to just companies. to let, yeah just yeah, to let you know about the market company. right a small yogurt chain of 100 stores uses 3 million spoons per month yeah so there's yeah. an incredible opportunity yeah 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 there's a lot of opportunity but the, the biggest con- challenge i have is cost one the second is education right see it, this product is easy to pitch to people but it's very hard to pitch it to corporates not everyone is as inclined towards sustainability they like to talk about it but to implement it's a big big task i don't want to name no, the company they have their they have their own uh, constraints also because i guess mm-hmm. because ultimately they also look at what the cost addition is mm. and is there a delta will they get any benefit from no, that so no, they could get a branding benefit you know no it's but, not yeah. just about that way so oh, one okay. way we twisted this product is i like a person wise it's sustainability eco friendly and all that stuff company wise we tell them let's say i'm giving you a 3 million spoons per month at 10 10 cents per spoon or 8 cents per spoon you can charge your customer up to 20 25 cents and they are willing to buy it i did a data actually we worked with hagandas in 2020 with the same question they were worried about money uh, spending so much for a spoon at that time my spoon was like 20 cents 20 25 cents so hagandas did a survey they did it in the ice cream store itself and 90% of the people were willing to pay 30 cents or more for this we already have the data but still the reason why that's not being implemented is it's a huge change for them which they try to move away from they have to train all the cashiers yeah. they have to train all the you know it's a it's a big effort for them concept is nice yeah. they like it yeah. but it's yeah. and i also i also it's hard. yeah sorry I'm, sorry i'm going to, sorry i'm interrupting yeah. you but i also like the idea because i wanted to add that to the listeners especially yeah. is yeah. that it's great that you can use it not just for cold but also hot products yeah, 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 and true. you said you know like even in a hot product it will last 20 30 minutes, minutes. Yeah. which is which is significant you know if you're having a spoon or yeah. anything uh, sorry soup or anything else you can actually sustain it for the period mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. time and then of course you can consume it which is also a great thing mm-hmm. yep yep that's true um yeah we only raised 225k till now just to let you know only that much and it's all bootstrapped and that's one of the reasons why i recently moved from having virtual assistants i had some virtual assistants before but i it was getting too expensive i have to cut down on my cost to be more profitable so i can invest more in ads and some other things so uh we recently moved uh, that's another big thing i learned in the last 4 5 months using phantom booster axiom airtable and make we made the i made this i, I mean, i'm a technical guy right so i kind of like all this fun fun stuff so right now all i do is put a put a city name it automatically scrapes the ice cream shops cafe shops and use goes to my email i don't like mass email like clavio and all these places because it doesn't go from dinesh at idashheets.com or anything it goes from some other uh, signature which sometimes goes into spam or or into promotions so i i kind of sell and also it also goes to my instagram and messages to those coffee shops so like kind of did all that work and it only cost me like 150 per month all this together so that's incredible yeah, yeah so, there's so, so much and i'm sure yeah, there's so much yeah, learning that yeah, comes yeah, from that process yeah, yeah. yeah so so okay i'm sort of going to veer towards mm-hmm. you know towards the closure but uh, but talk to me about what what would your ideal vision look like and i know you've talked about 100 million but i'm sure yeah. your vision is beyond that so yeah. so you know so what is so if you look at uh, incredible beats in uh, maybe 5 years timeline mm-hmm. what would you like to see it as and how would you like to scale 
I want to my product to be a commodity. Right now, it's not. It's just a product. So if like how plastic spoons became a commodity, I want my product to be a commodity. At least given an option. I know it's going to be expensive no matter how many years into the future because I can't beat the cost of plastic. But at least if 20 to 25 percent of the people will can have an option like how they can have an option to eat in a cone versus eating in a cup. Same thing. If they can have an option to e use eating an edible cutlery, even if they're going to eat it or not, it doesn't matter. So that's my final goal. That's the only goal I have, literally. And these hundred million dollars is because I want. I didn't want to take money before before that. But yeah, and you will be surprised with the numbers. US disposes of hundred million plastic cutlery per day. Yeah, per I can imagine day. it has to be. Yeah. Per day. I'm I'm not even talking about per month or per per year. It's huge. It's it's the amount of uh, consumption here. So, but on, again, I, I, I don't want listeners to feel that everything is going so smooth for me. There has been a ton of challenges, especially with money. Right now, also, we're in a very challenging time because our machines have aged. We need to get more new machines. And I depleted my resources personally, and I don't have investments. Right now, to raise investments is super hard. There are a lot of these other challenges which go beyond this. Because see, in, especially a CPG or a food company, you need at least five to six years of burning money before you even see making money. And I have to sustain with all this, right? That's one of the reasons why I had to move to AI stuff because it was much more cheaper for me to do it. So all these things are there. Uh, we, I'm trying my best, but it's in the end, I'm also feeling very afraid because I, I'm losing confidence day by day when I especially, I, I would say I spoke to 40% of the fast food chains in the US. I already pitched to them. I already worked with them, but I haven't seen them saying yes yet. There are some Traction who said no. Created. Yeah, yeah. I, the big ones. I'm, see, again, my goal is the big guys, right? I told you just now 100 ice cream uh, yogurt shops, a chain with just 100 yogurt shops, they use 3 million per month. And all it takes is 1% to say yes, because then things will automatically roll into the other side. Yeah, yeah. So, amazing. So I was in a conference yesterday. Yeah. And uh, so I, I'm giving you a glimmer of hope. So I, I was in a, con a conference yesterday where I was just randomly sitting with somebody and yeah. it's, uh, it's called Hack Summit in Lausanne in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. There's a woman who was sitting next to me and something came up and she said, oh, I listen to your podcast every every nice. week or every other week. So I was like, what? Wow. You know, nice. and something, something. And she said, and she was an investor. Oh, so, nice. so I'm hoping that, you know, some of these investors would be listening to this because yeah. I think you have an incredible product. You have incredible passion around that product. Mm -hmm. I think it makes all the sense. As a consumer, I can see it makes yeah. all the sense. And at least what you are saying is just offer it as an alternate. If a person yeah, wants yeah. it, great. If they yeah. don't want it, that's fine. You use your plastic spoon or your PLA <laughs> yeah, spoon yeah, yeah, or your yeah. start spoon yeah. or whatever. So so that's great. So I have to obviously yeah, yeah, sure. close the arc. And mm -hmm. of course, our final question. And of course, if anything else you want to add, please go mm -hmm. ahead and do. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, and then taking it to the final question, what would good good garbage mean for you? <laughs> yeah, a good garbage is basically no garbage creator, right? So in a fun way, but then something that uh, on, on the terms of it, as I mentioned before, coming back to the cradle to cradle book, any product that we use, first thing is we have to use it only if you need it. That's very hard to do. It's not easy. Human behavior it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. The second thing is uh, the end of life, right? Uh, like, especially, I'm not talking about cutlery or anything like that, like like clothes and all these things. There are a lot of other opportunities that you can actually extend the life of the product, even if you don't want it. And, and the third, finally, if there is some garbage that is there, it has to be disappearing in the environment at least in a, in a reasonable time like around like 10 to 15 years not like in decades not like in hundreds of years or something like that and uh, i do know there are a lot of good alternatives that are coming in like from air carbon like based on the straws and all that. but the thing is I, I i like the concepts but i don't know the re i don't know the scientific aspects of it what is the process to create them and what are the claims see find filing a claim based on a lab result is different from doing it by really in the environment and i think the the time will give the answers for it but yeah anything all in the end one thing i want to tell talk to listeners about is just observe your actions that's all it matters uh, like forget about how much trash you're creating or whatever it is just observe your actions is it really needed or not that's incredible Dinesh. it's been such a joy talking to you and feeling Likewise. your passion around the subject and you know the yeah. 
the way you are doing it is really incredible so thank you so much for sharing your ideas your thoughts being on the show and just having the courage to do something which is which is which is hard and it's it's, yeah. it's tough but it's also sort of it's, it needs people like you yeah. to be able thank to you. be passionate about it. so thank you thank you for being on the show thanks sir. thanks a lot for the opportunity we have thank you for listening to the good garbage podcast follow us on social media to never miss an episode links are in the description below i'm your host beth krishna see you next time